Global Forest Resources. Most of his research is done close in collaboration with local community groups. He's currently working on a, an extractive reserve, so I can't say any of it. Uh, that would be a type of show I'm about to but you got that off the web page, and that's 10 years old. I'm okay. going to say you're... So I won't I won't even give an introduction yeah. now because this introduction is 10 years old. <laughs> please welcome Dr. Peters. Thank you for inviting me. Can everybody hear me? I see that everyone's sort of sitting very far back. But can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Because I, I don't want to talk any louder than this. So let's see. Uh, I don't want to use my Red money, 
for some carbon uh, money. So if you if you involve local communities in your in your projects, it gives them uh, it gives them greater reason to be better stewards of, of their forests. So what I want to do this evening is I want to talk a little bit about first I want to give you a background of where I have worked for the past 30 years, and see, I, I call it 30 years of trial and error. And I'm saying that because sometimes, sometimes my projects have worked uh, just in an insanely great way that helped things a lot, and sometimes they've been mildly successful, and sometimes they haven't worked at all. And so I'm going to talk about the ones that work tonight, but I, wanna, I just want to give you some examples of, of places where I work. And so all the little red squares that you see that are sort of allocated, aligned around the, the tropics are, are where I've had projects. And I'll just give you one example. Uh, this project is actually still ongoing. It's in the state of Guerrero, Mexico. And I'm working with local communities who produce mezcal. Does everybody know what mezcal is? Yeah, good. You're not supposed to know that. So this gala is a fermented beverage that's made out of agave, and it's like tequila. Tequila is a type of mezcal. And communities harvest wild agave to ferment and produce this beverage. And my work with these communities is to demonstrate that the traditional ways of exploiting tropical dry forests is in fact sustainable, that these communities know very well what they're doing. And it's been, that's really sort of a very fun project. And then I have another project <coughs> that was actually, it's finished now, but it was in the state of Quintango in, in Mexico, and I was working with several communities, 10 communities actually, of Maya foresters, Mayan foresters, who were managing mahogany managing their forest to sustainably produce mahogany. And many of these forests, many of these communities had their forests certified by the Forest Stewardship Council. These are the oldest certified tropical forests in the world. All right, this is kind of fun. I just touched the iPad and project comes up. <laughs> oh, and then, then I have another project. I was actually doing this project uh, in the mid-1980s, it was in, in Peru, and it was looking at the wild harvesting of this fruit, which is called camu camu, and camu camu fruit has the highest concentration of vitamin C of any plant in the world. So for example, oranges have about 30 milligrams of vitamin C per 100 grams of pulp, and camu camu has 3,000. Oh, geez. Oh, geez. Wow. Yeah, so it is, and I, I can remember uh, as I was counting fruits, eating these fruits, and I would, I would just get blisters on my, on my, on my mouth, on my, but I never got a cold. <laughs> yeah, it was good. So these are all sort of in new little projects. Okay, and then I have uh, another project I'm still sort of involved with was in the Hukum Valley and in Myanmar, and was a community forestry project working with three Kachin villages, uh, helping them describe the forest resources that they have in their forest and how they could be sustainably exploited and working with them to write a management plan so that the government of Myanmar would give them a permit to let them keep doing what they've been doing for so long. Then, oh, this was a good project. Then I have another project that's in southwestern China, in Guizhou, China. Another community forestry project looking at uh, traditional ways of managing landscapes by the Miao people or Hmong people in China. Uh, and basically managing pine forests within a montane setting. And then, oh, okay. And then a project in central Vietnam, in the Trung Trung Mountains of Vietnam. And this project was involving six nature reserves and <coughs> training 
forestry staff to go into these nature reserves and inventory and identify the rattan. Now, does everybody know what rattan is? Does anybody know what rattan is? Okay, rattan is a, is a palm. It's a spiny, climbing palm that you split and can use to make furniture out of, like cane furniture if you you will see rattan furniture at Pier 1, you will see rattan furniture at Crate and Barrel, you will see rattan furniture at Ikea, for example. It looks kind of like wicker. Uh, it's used by, traditionally, to make baskets and to make mats. And I'm actually going to talk a little bit more about rattan later this evening, but rattan forms the basis of a multi-billion dollar a year furniture industry. And this is of interest because it's all wild horses. None of, none of these rattan canes are planted. So local harvesters just go in the forest and they find a rattan cane and they cut it and they just yank it out of the canopy of the tree and will sell it. Okay. So this project was looking, uh, was trying to inventory the rattans in central Vietnam because central Vietnam is one of the largest producers of rattan in the world. They're running out of raw material and they wanted to know if it could be managed and so on. Okay, so I have all of these projects. There's a lot of red dots that I didn't talk about and maybe some of these projects didn't work so well. Actually, that project right there didn't work so well, but I'm not gonna say anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and there's two projects that I want to give you some more details about this evening. And I guess, Carlos, then we, I just talk and then you can ask questions afterwards. Is that the way this is going? Yes. Okay. So the first project I'm going to talk about is in northern Myanmar. It used to be called Burma. It's up here. And so Myanmar is wedged between India and China. And uh, we don't really hear much about this country because it's been sort of isolated for so long. Maybe if you know something about Myanmar, maybe you know Aung San Suu Kyi, who uh, won the Nobel Prize, who was actually elected president of the country, and then was there was a coup, and the military took control over the country and put her under house arrest, where she was for maybe 15 years. She's not no longer under house arrest. She actually has a seat in parliament, so things are changing in Myanmar. Uh, I started this project when Aung San Suu Kyi was still under house arrest. Um, the, the northern part of Myanmar, up in here, has three protected areas. And the one that I want to talk about tonight is called the Hukum Valley Tiger Reserve. And this protected area is actually the largest protected area in the world. It's bigger than the state of Vermont, and it was set aside by the Burmese government, or the Myanmar government, for uh, tiger conservation. So it's a huge tract. Hukong means, Hukong Valley means the Valley of Death. And the reason why they call it the Valley of Death, it's a sort of very low-lying valley, and during the rainy season, there's a lot of malaria there. You don't really want to go there during the rainy season because of uh, all the malaria. So I, I didn't actually go there in the rain school. Uh, Myanmar is of great interest right now in terms of global biodiversity. So, I mean, just look at, look at where this protected area is. It's up here in northern Myanmar. And I have another map I want to show you, which is, this is the green here are remaining forests in Southeast Asia. And if you can see, here's Myanmar, northern Myanmar here. And so over half of the remaining forests, the remaining tropical forests in Southeast Asia are found in northern Myanmar. Okay, so it's really, really important. And very few people have ever had an opportunity to go in there to collect plants or to study the ecology of the forest because the country has been so closed for so long. So it was a great opportunity for me to be able to work there. Okay, um, 
This is the Tiger Reserve uh, in Myanmar. And one of the main, there's several features about this that I want to talk about. But one of the main features is that going right down through the middle of the reserve is a road, which now is actually more of a, a footpath, but it used to be a road. They built a road. And this road is called the Lido Road, or the Stillwell Road. And this was a road that was built at the end of World War II to fly supplies to Chiang Kai-shek in China. Uh, not to fly, to, to drive supplies to Chiang Kai-shek. And so what was happening before is that they would fly things into China. And if you fly this way over the top, these are the Himalayas up here. And so the planes were crashing. And so the supplies weren't getting there. And that was a problem. And so one general, General Stilwell, had the idea. They said, I can build a road. I can build a road from India, from Lido in India into China, going through the northern Burma. And so they said, OK, why don't you do that? And so they gave them all the supplies. And here they are at the end of World War II, building the Lido Road. And it's a fascinating story. What I remember, I think, is for every kilometer of the road, several hundred people died. And I'm sure it was several hundred Burmese people that died. But so just the cost of building this road was enormous. And once they finished the road and got all the way from India and then into China, then the war was over. <laughs> and so the road was abandoned. And again, the road now, in parts, is about as wide as this desk right here. It's very, it's a footpath. But it is still, um, still provides access to the Hukum Valley. Okay. The other thing of interest, I think, of course, in the Hukum Valley is the fact that the last remaining tigers in Southeast Asia live there. So there's a population, an undefined population, let's say several hundred tigers that still live there. And uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society, or the Bronx Zoo, has had a research program there for over a decade now, uh, trying to inventory and conserve the tiger populations. The third thing I think of interest there is that the reserve contains large populations of these rattan palms. So this is these spiny climbing palms. That's what they look like. And it's like you almost couldn't invent a more gnarly looking plant. <laughs> and so those spines are very stiff, they're very sharp, and uh, again, they, they, it's, a, it's a liana, so it climbs up a tree. Some of them can be 30, 40, 50, 60 meters long. And you cut the plant at, at the base, and then you pull it out of the crown of the tree. And then with your bush knife or your machete, you cut off the spines. And that, that's the product that you can sell. Okay. So we've got the rug, we have the tigers, and we have the rattan. Now, how did I get involved? <coughs> Uh, the Botanical Garden is right across the street from the Wildlife Conservation Society. And I don't really know a lot about how you census tigers, but I know that they use camera traps. So they will go, you guys know about camera traps, right? So they will go and put a lot of cameras uh, out in the forest, and these cameras will either be uh, hooked up to a trip wire or an electric eye so that if an animal breaks the trip wire or goes in front of the electric eye, it snaps a picture. So the Wildlife Conservation Society put hundreds of these cameras out in the forest in the Hukum Valley. You leave them out for six months, then you go back relocate the cameras, get, take the film out, or take the flash drive out, and you look at see what your pictures. And they got uh, many pictures of tigers, but more than pictures of tigers, what they got, do you know what they got? Poachers. They got poachers, too. 
Well, what else did they have? You know what they got? They got rattan collectors. They got people walking through the forest with bundles of rattan that they had just harvested out of this hectare. And so then my phone rang. And so Alan Rabinowitz calls me on the phone and he goes, uh, do you know anything about rattan? I said, yes. Uh, full disclosure, no, I know nothing about rattan. <laughs> Can you manage your tan? Yes, you can. You can manage any plant. Anyway, so I, the idea was, can 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 we go to the Hukum Valley and see what rattans are being harvested, what impact it's having on wild populations, and what is is there any way that tiger conservation and rattan exploitation can coexist, or is there a problem? And so we said, yes, let's do that. And so we actually did that in 2005. Myself and a palm systematist at the Botanical Garden named Andrew Henderson, who is right there. And that's me, that appeared in 2005. And so what we did, this is the leader road, we actually drove up in these two monster trucks during the, during the dry season up to the border of India. And then the truck left us there and then Andrew and I and a crew of about four Burmese scientists and a staff of about 12 other people, slowly, with elephants, walked down, this was a great project, walked down the Leo Road, and all these little triangles were base camps that we met, made. So we were walking down the Leo Road, and every so often we would stop and make a base camp, and we would go in the forest and collect rattan palms and do inventories of rattan palms. And so we did that for about six weeks. This is why you go to graduate school, <laughs> to do that. OK, and so, so what did we find as a result of this? Well, we found, we found a couple of things. We found two new species of rattan to science that no one had ever seen. And again, it's important that you understand that a rattan plant can be, uh, you know, 40 stories tall. This is not a little plant. This is this is something very hard to miss. But no one had ever been in this area before looking at rattans. So we had two species of rattans, two new species that, that Dr. Henderson described. And then the results of our inventories, what we what we showed is that, all right, so here's the size of the rattan in meters. Now the beauty not the beauty. Yes, I guess. The benefit of uh, rattan harvest is that a collector cannot sell a rattan cane that's smaller than four meters long. So if you harvest something that's under 12 feet long, you can't sell it. And so people, local collectors will not harvest. All they harvest is this stuff. You can't sell this stuff. So they just leave it in the forest. And so if you talk to a local collector, they will say, there's no more rattan in the forest. And what they mean is there's no more commercial rattan in the forest. And so what we found is that there actually was a lot of rattan still in the forest, maybe several thousand rattan canes. And this is per hectare, which is two and a half acres. So there's lots and lots of rattan in the forest. It just needs to be managed, and it could be managed. And the other thing that we found is that rattan collectors will not go further than about half a kilometer off the road to harvest. Just because it's too hard, the rattan cane's too heavy, you know, they have a landing near the road, the trucks are on the road, and the price that they are paid for the raw material is, is not enough to move them more than half a kilometer off the road. And this area around the road is exactly the habitat that tigers avoid because it's dusty, it's noisy, there are human beings there. And so it's actually they're exploiting a different niche. Uh, and so the finding, our report showed that one, it would be a really good thing to manage the rattan there because it would give a source of income to local people. And it, we could also incorporate Tiger conservation program as well, even the source of income 
and sort of bundle them together with the Tiger Conservation Program. This is, this is actually what the Lido Road looks like now. And these are, that's for Jan Kane. And all of this material is being trucked out down the Lido Road into China. And then Myanmar sells about 90% of all this from Kenya to China. So this project is, is ongoing. And I, I would say that this project had uh, was successful, is still successful, and it, that it solved the problem. Okay. Has anyone ever seen a carved, painted, whimsical wooden figure like this from Mexico? Do you know what they're called? Did you get one for Christmas? Okay, they're called alabillas. And they, it's, they're really, really lovely. If, you, if someone goes to Mexico, you're going to buy one of these because they're great. You, know, you have dragons or like this big cat and just all sorts of animals. I know that during holiday seasons, you can buy, you can buy them in Macy's. I mean, it's really a, it's a, it's a big, big thing. And the way that this started is not a traditional handicraft per se in Mexico, but it's, it's something that happened in the 70s where a farmer was carving and painting toys for his kid and someone from the phone art saw that and said, oh, we can sell that. And then it just started snowballing. Okay. And then little by little I got involved in that. And so they, they must make hundreds of thousands of these alabillas. Uh, every year, and they're all made out of one species of tree, which is called Bursera glyphofolia, or it's in, in Spanish it's called it's called copada. This is what it looks like, uh, and this is sort of the habitat. It, it grows in dry forest, tropical dry forest, and so this is Oaxaca City, and I'm trying to and so. These communities, these are the carving communities right here, these dots. And the carving communities, it's, it's such a popular handicraft that around these communities, all of the copal trees have, have been completely eliminated from the forest. There's no more copal trees anymore. And so the raw material that they need to keep carving these figures now um, is brought by these guys right here. And it's amazing that I got this picture because they usually bring the wood into the village at night because it's harvested illegally. And it's harvested illegally from this place right here that's called La Cana de Futsalam, which is <coughs> it's a nature reserve. So what they're doing is that they drive up from Waka City up into the nature reserve harvest this wood, drive back to the villages, and sell it at night, and the, the, the carvers have to pay whatever price these middlemen want for the wood. Okay. Um, and that's kind of when I got involved. The, this was sort of a bad deal. You know, one, it's a valuable handicraft. The wood that the carvers need right now is being harvested from. It's not even, it's a biosphere. And they're being ripped off by the middleman, et cetera, et cetera. And so with my Mexican colleagues, I started making trips to Mexico and sort of actually setting out from Oaxaca City, sort of in concentric circles, looking for communities that had tracks and dry forests. This was also a very fun part of my job. You know, Oaxaca has really good food, right? So we were sort of looking for copal trees and eating the mole. Right, and, and so we found a community right here, which is called Hayekatlan. This is actually Hayekatlan right here. That had several thousand hectares of tropical dry forest. And so we went to the community and we started the dialogue in a, in a, in a meeting about, did you know that uh, the wood that is used to carve those little alabrias grows in 
your dry forest here? No, I didn't know that because they are, they're farmers. And did you know that uh, carvers now have to spend a lot of money to buy the straw material so that they can keep carving these things? No, I didn't know that. Would you be interested in managing the copal trees in your forest on a sustainable basis and selling it to these carving communities as a source of income for the village. I thought that was a great idea. So to take something that has no value to them and give it value. And they said, yes, we want to do that. And so over the next two years, we worked with the community of Haikatlan uh, and we did all sorts of things. They ran them against the period, the period comes and goes. <laughs> Uh, so we did a lot of things. We did a quantitative inventory of topology, so we went out with them in their forest. We, we trained them how to do inventories and went out and counted their copal trees. And then we did, you know, how fast do they grow and how much wood can they produce, which is what we're doing here. We're weighing the wood to see how much wood is produced. And then we did a survey of regeneration to see if the trees were regenerating in the forest if there were enough seedlings. And then we put growth bands on the trees to see how fast they grow. And we had a student from the University of Mexico do her doctoral dissertation in this very complicated mathematical model looking at uh, was it a sustainable management plan or not. We built this very sophisticated geographic information system for the community. And we did all this stuff. And we wrote a management plan and with them. And that took forever to get everybody on the same page about this management plan. And so we finally got the management plan that they liked and that I liked and that it looked good. And so we submitted that to, uh, it's, in Spanish it's called Semadonat. It's the Se Secretary of uh, Agriculture and National Resources. It's sort of like the Ministry of Forestry. It's the person, it's the committee, it's the organization that needs to approve a management plan to give you a permit to use your forest. Okay? It's the official government agency. And so we submitted that and then we waited and we waited and we waited and I think maybe six months went by Maybe eight months went by and I was doing other things, but I said, I think something's wrong here. And so I contacted my Mexican collaborators and, I, and I, I said, Sylvia, I think you should I think you should call them. I think something has gone really wrong here. And so she did. So Sylvia so called him up and she said, Did you guys she was doing this in Spanish, you know, did you guys get a management plan from us for uh, San Juan Bautista Haikalan about cobalt trees and the guy goes, yeah, no, we got that. Is there, was there a problem with, did we do something wrong or have you lost it? I don't think she's there. Uh, and they said, no, 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 we got it. It looks really, really good on pause. And they said, you know, we don't really know what to do with your solicit, with your, how do you say solicit too? With your, how do you say solicitude in English? Your application. With your application. We don't know what to do with your application. Look at this. We don't know what to do with your application. It says, here in Mexico, we don't really manage dry forest. We convert it to agriculture or we make a pasture of it because a dry forest doesn't have tall, straight, big trees in it with any sort of forestry potential. It has short, water-stressed, twisted trees that don't produce timber, but can produce wood for a number of purposes. And uh, so we continued to explain to the gentleman, and then what happened finally is he gave him the permit. This is the permit, 2003. Now, you know, I showed this and you go, maybe you do this. I don't know. This is the first time a dry forest which is the most threatened ecosystem in Mexico, more than tropical rainforests. This is the first time that a management permit has ever been issued for this. So this could be, I don't know, really, this is amazing. <laughs> Woo, this is the first time. <laughs> And so 
then they could harvest the forest. They could sell the material to the carbon communities. And you know what we did? We went into the carbon communities and we, we used what I call the Microsoft strategy. Is that we went to the community and we said, how much are the other guys charging for the wood? And so we, we charged them half because our wood was legal. And then we said, do you like, uh, not just we're dumping the wood out of the back of the truck. It was like, do you like big pieces? Do you like crooked pieces? How do you, you know exactly what do you want? And so we sold it exactly what they wanted. And so the market is, is continuing on. Heidegger is continuing to manage the forest and produce this. And now a whole new type of alabini has come out, which is called an eco alabini which is produced out of this sustainably harvested wood. And if you go to a hawker, you may see these things, and it will cost you maybe 10 pesos more. And the, the extra money goes back to the community for doing that. Okay. So these are two examples of research projects or development projects or applied research projects that I've been involved with that involve tropical forests and communities and solving a problem. And I think I think there's a lot of benefit in this type of analysis of applied research. And that's all I have to say if you have any questions. Why can't they use a different kind of wood? You know, it, this wood, it's very, very soft. It's easy to carve. Now, of course, I'm not a carver. It's very, very easy to carve. It also has a, a wonderful fragrance to it. And you know, they've tried a lot of different things. And you know, I don't know, carvers uh, that they like this. And what, what we what we originally tried to play with is to cut the tree and this particular species will coppice or sprout. Oh. And we said, now this would really save us a lot of time if we could just you know, coppice it and have it sprout back. But apparently, the second row of wood, mm -hmm. they don't like that either. <laughs> it's different. It's different wood. They can tell the difference. They can tell the difference. The car is different. It has, yeah. And so, you know, what do you say? You say, okay, it's just a, yeah, they didn't like that either. They, it, it needs to be a whole, you know, freshly grown of culture. Anything else? Yes. Going back to the first project, yeah. uh, you talked about the road a lot, but yeah. did that fragment the environment where the tigers are? I think it did. I think it did. You know, tigers go across the road, and, uh, you know, tigers get killed going across the road. And, you know, the, the thing about probably, yeah, definitely, you know, again, the, this protected area is 3,800 square miles in size. So it's huge. And so even if you had only one half of the area, it would be okay. But, uh, you know, the problem is, is that if you're a rattan collector, and most of the retaining collectors that I know, they, you know, they carry firearms. They're usually homemade firearms. But if they see a tiger, you know, the tiger is worth 10 years of collecting retaining. And so, I mean, that, that is, is sort of a, a threat. And so what, what we have found is that if you can give them sort of a guaranteed other source of income, Because you have to go really deep in the forest usually to, to get a tiger. They, they, they stop doing it. And, and I, I didn't bring all of all the pictures and, and stuff, but the bridges that go that are part of the Lido Road that the al Allies built out of metal, those have since rusted and long gone. And so they're they're made out of poles now, wooden poles. This sort of root gold or wooden pole structure that's lashed together with your tan. And the, they have to be replaced about every three years. You know, again, if, if the bridges go down, the rattan trucks can't get in and get out. But perhaps 
more problematic is that the Myanmar military can't get in and get out. And so the, the government pays and buys your hand every year to repair the bridges. So it's, you know, it's a wonderful guaranteed market for the retaining Did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? I have some questions. Sure. Um, there was a controversy a few years ago uh -huh. uh, about the importation of Kapu wood into the United States for the manufacture of guitars. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about that? I think one of them, uh, a few have Taylor and Martin have been on the right side in terms of importation, and it was either Guild, I think, or Gibson were yeah, not on the right side. Yeah, I, mean, I remember about that, and I remember that there is a, there's an organization now that's sort of working to make sure that the, the right woods are used for them. And you know, the only thing that I can really say about that is that things go on and off the CITES list, the Species and Dangers of Extinction list, for a number of reasons. And sometimes they're not the right reasons. Uh, I, I know, for example, that I have 10 communities of Mayan foresters that are FSC certified sustainably producing mahogany wood. You know, they grow the trees, they plant the trees. And mahogany has been on and off the site list. And so, you know, that's problematic because you're growing, you can't, you know, there, there might be several years where you can't sell the material. And, you know, so in the, in the case, I think it was, was it this one or more, but uh, and the case where, I don't know if it was that someone bought the wood knowing that it was a species that was on the sightings list, or somebody bought the wood thinking that it was something else, and then the whistle was blown. But there are people that are very, very much working on that and conscious of that. And, you know, I was asking, that whole Bruja was, uh, I think, a nice, you know, I think it was useful. Yes, brought some attention yeah, to this sure. issue. Yeah. Have you been to Vietnam? Yeah. Is there any long-term effects of the use of Agent Orange by the United States military yes, in Vietnam? Thank you. thank you for asking. The six protected areas that we were working in in Central The Ho Chi Minh Trail goes right through the Trunks of the And you know, I know that 40 years ago, 45 years ago, those forests were probably bombed every day because they were running supplies down there. And Agent Orange as well. And you know, fortunately or unfortunately, that's where the rattan is now because rattan is sort of a light demanding really likes to stir up. And, uh, you know, again, I take it, in fact, to, to the forest, and it's beautiful, beautiful forest. Super steep. But uh, Vietnam has been sort of mortgaging the rattan resources that were pr produced by this, by the Vietnam War. Uh, you know, it generates maybe, you know, I'm just trying to think. They sell millions, millions of dollars for understanding this every year of the game because from your history cards. I'm not saying we should do that again, but it's amazing. You look at where where are the retain resources, you know, retains are weed. Where are the retain resources in Vietnam? Well the the high the highest density pockets are located right along the chain of trail. It, 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 the thing is, you know, it's a, it's a climber, and so you know, the first thing that that's telling you is it's trying to get out of the shade, it's trying to get up into the canopy to have some light. And so if you have sort of a patchy, more illuminated understory, you get a lot more rattan seedlings, and then you get a lot more adult rattans, and it just keeps building and building and building. Other questions?
Yeah. Um, nowadays, we uh, seem to exploit a lot of our natural resources, not just trees, but oil, even water. And a lot of times, humans act like, you know, they own these possessions when really they didn't even, it's not we earn them. Um, they just exist. So how do you, with your background, how do you feel about putting monetary value on these natural resources that would? Oh, that's a really complicated question. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because um, it, it goes both ways. And it, it, I, I sort of think um, value to whom? I mean, and we'll so, be. you know, in terms of value to local communities that may have been living there for 200 years such that they have an economic rationale for maintaining the forest and forest, for not converting the forest to some other form of land use that will generate more revenues, whether it be, you know, whatever. Uh, oil palm plantation or soybeans or whatever. It's just like helping them to preserve the forest by showing them how to make money out of it. I'm okay with that. Just because you know, it's, there's a conservation benefit to that. Uh, the expansion of teak plantations in Western Borneo, no, Western Burma, to make decks for yachts and displacing other things because it's such a valuable. Yeah, maybe that's not the best thing to do. But yeah, I appreciate your question. I, you know, I would tease out the wood from the water and the petrochemicals because I really do think wood it, it can be managed. It's a Yes. Sorry, for the base camps in Burma, yeah. um, are scientists living there year round or are they only yeah. one period? No, you know, right now there's no one in Hukong Valley, not even the Burmese staff is there because my more is, uh, is going through a really wonderful place right now. Things are opening up. Again, Aung San Suu Kyi has a parliament seat, and they have a new president, and they let they release a lot of political prisoners. And Coca Cola has moved back. No, Coca Cola has moved into Yanga. There was never Coca Cola in Yanga, <coughs> and so I mean, I, I can't. I, the times that I've been, all the times that I've been there, you never see a Coca Cola sign. It's just like you don't know what planet you're in because there's no Coca Cola sign. But now there's a Coca Cola bottling company. So this is all wonderful, except in Kachin State, where Hukum Valley, the Kachin people have never really wanted to be part of Burma at all. And they have been fighting the Burmese military uh, ever since they, the Burmese military took over the country. And I, you know, there's all these wonderful things, that story in the New York Times, uh, ceasefire with the Kachin, Ratified next day, letter to the editor, head of the Kachin, Independence <coughs> Army. Not true, not true. We never signed anything. You know, so they don't want to be part of anything, any of this. And so it's still, there's still a civil war going on in that part of, of my mind. And so yeah, even the WCS staff is not there. I, I, actually, I work in a state that's too now. Lisa, you're here in this, right? I, just, I don't like to talk about this when my wife's right here. I work to a, a state that's on the western side, it's called Sagan Division, which is more, more peaceful than more. It's more sort of under control. Yes? Where's your big project right now? Uh, I think my big project, I just finished a really big project in. Laos can wait in Vietnam, I think I told you about that, which uh, again with Palm scientist Andrew Henderson, and that, which was, is a book, and I should have a book to get put in your library because I see the library. 
the Socali Abyssinians book. But this book is, will show you how to identify Rattans in Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. So there was never a field guide to Rattans. I mean, we didn't know, you know, these countries are making tens of millions of dollars a year, but we never really knew the names of the Rattans. That seems weird. And at the same time, it, it will show you how to identify the Rattans and then what needs to be done for you to manage your Rattans on a sustainable basis so that you can sustainably harvest Rattan. And the study to produce this book and the publication of this book was uh, funded by a generous subvention by the IKEA, by IKEA, because they sell IKEA. Uh, they sell all the tan furniture and they want to uh, have a greener source of raw materials to sell. Uh, and then the <coughs> project, I'm actually, it's a community forestry project in, in Myanmar, which I'm going to be going next month. And we'll be used starting a community forestry in a small village on land. It's sort of funny, but there are, there are lands in mine that are known as, as uh, plane jet, that the Ministry of Forestry has a plane jet. And I think they're called, there's a statue, it's vacant, unused and vacant lands. Now, of course, the, the community's been living for 500 years, but unused and vacant land. And they've really done a fantastic job over the past four or five hundred years in conserving the forest and managing the forest and using the forest wisely. And the idea would be to document that, to do a management plan, and to get them uh, you know, a community concession to continue doing what they're doing. I would like to make that happen. Yes? Are there any uh, pharmaceutical natural products that are under threat from over harvesting? You know, right now I can't think of any pharmaceutical that's based on a wild harvested plant. You know, I think there's a, I wish you know, Dr. Bell could know that. I, there's a large percentage of plants, uh, of pharmaceuticals that are based on compounds found in plants. But it's, it's just so much easier to synthesize it than to, you know, have someone, and even, even if they find a compound in a plant, you know, you're not, you're not planting yams to get steroids for birth control. <laughs> yes. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you.